So hi everybody, um, like Nick says, my name is Kerry McKenzie. I think I'm going to be the sort of metaphysics court jester of this uh, <laughs> of this meeting, which is fine with me, but um, uh, it doesn't mean you're going to be subjected to some analytic metaphysics a little bit. Um, but it's not going to be, um, those metaphysics, we're not going to be doing armchair metaphysics, because that's not what I do. We're going to be doing what I what anybody, I suppose, would call naturalistic fundamentality metaphysics. Um, I'll say a bit about what that means, um, but what we're going to be focusing on in particular is whether um, quantum field theory has significant metaphysical implications. Now, pretty much anybody who does metaphysics and quantum field theory is going to think, yes, it does. Um, and pretty much everybody who writes about metaphysics and quantum field theory, I think maybe even Don talking about this yesterday, um, claims that it has, if only implicitly, implications for what we should take as fundamental. Um, the three topics, I have a feeling I might only talk about two of these, but um, uh, the topics that, I've, that I'm going to be discussing, hopefully, in the next couple of days, are my own kind of idiosyncratic, my kind of um, pet favorites, if you like, right? Um, in particular, I'm going to be thinking about um, what quantum field theory has to say about theories of modality. So in particular, um, uh, for the question of whether modality is somehow a fundamental constituent of reality, which is a kind of one way of rendering the debate between the humans and the anti humans right, which has two sides in this debate. Um, thinking about whether it has implications uh, for the thesis that relational structure somehow and not objects are ontologically fundamental, which is the thesis of ontic structural realism, which many of you may be familiar with. And I'm going to be asking whether it has significant implications for the way that we should actually think about fundamentality itself. Um, so, uh, like I say, there's many more ways that one could argue quantum field theory has implications for the fundamental, but these are the ones that, that I'm going to focus on. So, to say a little bit um, about what I mean by naturalistic fundamentality metaphysics. Well, fundamentality metaphysics is quite clearly the metaphysics of the fundamental. Um, now, in focusing on the fundamental, as a metaphysician, I'm not doing anything remotely unusual because it's just been, for whatever reason, um, more and more foregrounded in metaphysics, perhaps of the last sort of 15, 20 years, um, that metaphysics is sort of definitionally about the fundamental. So here's like a bunch of quotes. Metaphysics at bottom is about the fundamental structure of reality. Right, that's Ted Sider. Metaphysics is the, system the systematic study of the most fundamental structure of reality. Right, that's Jonathan Lowe. People, uh, Thomas Bigash and Chris Wittrich, that I'm sure many of you know, um, in a nutshell they say, metaphysics is the study of the fundamental structure of reality. Okay, and so on and so on and so on. These are just a bunch of quotes that I pulled out. I didn't pull out many more. Um, this is just how metaphysicians see what they do. They study the fundamental. That's kind of your job description if you're a metaphysician. And I, can I just ask you, why do you think that is? I do not know the answer to this question. Anybody got any ideas? We can think about it more tomorrow. Yeah. So that you know the questions are substantive as opposed to merely terminological. So do you think that any question about like whether the bus is going to come in ten minutes or not is just a question that's merely terminological? Uh, no, but I think the kind of questions that somebody like Ted wants to ask, uh -huh. you would be afraid that they're merely terminological if you didn't stipulate that we're asking about asking those questions in a fundamental way. Right. Whereas the bus question, you don't have that worry because it's got clear empirical content. Okay. Um, so some people are going to say, some metaphysicians are going to say that metaphysics by definition doesn't have any empirical, doesn't have any empirical content. So it's the claim that when you don't have empirical content, it has to be about the fundamental. And when it does have empirical content, you don't have to worry that it's just terminal. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know if metaphysics is definitionally about the the non-empirical, but yeah, like for those metaphysical questions that are about the non-empirical, I think the idea is that if you stipulate that they are about the fundamental, then you can you have you can make a case that they're substantive as opposed to terminological. 
Yeah, so certainly this is a view this is a view that many metaphysicians would would sort of argue for. So I think it's um, it's kind of summed up in saying that this is what Ted Sider thinks, that really only the fundamental is real. Everything that's not fundamental is some kind of mind dependent abstraction from the real. Or maybe there's some other problems with the reality of that stuff. Now, yeah. Can I ask an ignorant question? Uh, yes. I'm a physicist, and a okay. lot of physicists would say they study the fundamental structure of reality, and they would be caught dead being called metaphysicians. <laughs> yeah. So there's what fundamental means seems to be different in these cases. So there's that, really so there's a lot of interesting questions about how metaphysicians think about what's fundamental and how physicists think about what's fundamental. I'm really today trying to kind of bring two of these things together. Um, so two points here. So one, just to go back to the cider thing, um, one way that you can defend this, that metaphysics is about the fundamental by definition, is by saying that only the fundamental is real. And many people would say that. Kit Fine seems to say, I can't really make sense of a lot of what Kit Fine says, that mode of criticism. And, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's hard to get your head around. Uh, Ted Sider says um, the same thing, and these are two of the most kind of celebrated contemporary metaphysicians. Um, put it this way, there's nothing obvious to me about that at all. At least, at the very least, that in itself seems to be a really substantive metaphysical commitment. Um, uh, there's a whole tradition in um, philosophy of physics that would explicitly deny that, right? Think about effective ontology. Like if a boulder <coughs> comes and smashes you in the face, right, um, and bowls you over, right, try telling you that that's not real or something like that. Um, so just to say that there's actually there's nothing obvious to me about this at all. This is just something that um, one often hears, and there's nothing obvious to me about it at all. Yeah. I often think that this and kind of talking and maybe that's what Prigoz and yeah. Vutrich have in mind as you know a way of cashing out Aristotle with metaphysics as the study of being qua being. Somehow the most abstract fundamental as a way of kind of getting at the most sort of abstract categories that you need to <coughs> to do the physics and talk yeah. about something like that. Yeah, so I'm kind of a bit happier with the idea that metaphysics is a sort of the most general study of kind of reality at its most general. Um, you know, one doesn't think about focus on like just the property of like charge or just the property of being blue, but rather properties in general and so on and so forth. Um, but it seems to me that if metaphysics is about reality in general, then it's not about just the fundamental. That's part of what makes it so generalist, that it has general application. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think there's something to what Nick says, because as I remember Blackburn's book on metaphysics, he says it's about ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. So I, I would, at least the way I would interpret it, the notion of fundamental here is another other way to say ultimate reality. And ultimate reality can be the smallest things, but it could also be ultimate reality about table and chair worlds, for instance. So it's not necessarily to do with the tiniest elements of reality. It's more that we are getting at reality at its real, uh, of, of how reality really is. Right, so sure. So yeah. these are, you know, one of the fundamental questions that the philosophical project asks itself is like, what, what is real and what is mere appearances? Yes. And insofar as metaphysics is about the real, um, uh, then it has a sort of a privileged subject matter. Presumably, <coughs> lots of the stuff that we seem to perceive around us, or we think we perceive around us, like colors, right, aren't actually real, and so on and so forth. But it's not obvious to me that everything that is, that is real in that sense has to be fundamental, right? So, look, I don't know the answers to these questions. I just think it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, it's an interesting thing to think about. Are you reading this afternoon my paper, the quantum gra the paper for the quantum gravity volume? Is it reading the dualities paper, a uh, paper on? Is Baptiste here? Yeah. Yeah, oh hiya. Are, is that something we're going to be talking about this afternoon? Uh, no, I think it's just the paper maybe. Yeah, that one? So, like, we could present this. Okay. So, I, the, I, it's something I kind of reflect on a little bit in that paper. So maybe you have another chance to talk about it. It's yeah. another really important question about yeah. theoretical physics. Uh, well, here you are. Maybe in physics, we have a distinction, uh, you know, not in physics and from other things. There's a distinction. I think there's two communities that study the fundamentals. There are physicists that yeah. study the fundamental of reality, but there's also mathematicians that study the fundamental of categories and structure, mm -hmm. with no pretension that this has anything to do with reality. It turns yeah. out that, you know, it happens sometimes, they're mm -hmm. part of the structure. And so here, I'm, I'm not sure which, when they're here, is it fundamental in the sense I'm, I'm studying mathematics, or is it fundamental in the sense I'm studying physics? That is one. one right. Is, so is I think it's going to be the sense. There's a possibility of fundamental structure, fundamental language, fundamental grammar, 
with no pretension that something Right, so I mean, I think if... That's physics though. Right, yeah, so I think it's going to be fundamental in the sense that physics... Not um, mathematics. No, no, I mean, so insofar as, you know, one takes the attitude to, uh, to mathematics that you outlined there, so something maybe like you're a formalist or something, um, you have no, this, no I, this, there's no pretension that this describes reality, it's a beautiful structure, say category theory, you have some axioms, you're going to take them as fundamental, the fundamental postulates of your system, but there's no pretension, as you say, that these describe, you know, the actual world, perhaps, in, or the physical world. Um, as opposed to some, it's just axioms of a system that you've that you kind of dreamt up. Physicists don't take themselves to be doing that kind of project, or at least not most of the time, right? Or at least if they are doing something that they know doesn't describe reality, like studying models of supersymmetric theories, right, that they know are not instantiated in nature, usually they're doing it to sort of help them figure out, solve problems that, um, that are needed to solve stuff in, in actual physics or something. But just to go quickly back to this question about physics, so yeah, I mean, I think what physicists say is that they are they're aiming to describe the fundamental structure of reality, or at least fundamental physicists are aiming to do that, but they're quite happy with the idea that that's not actually what they're doing yet, quite likely. Right? They're at least open to the idea, like insofar as you study the standard model and you call that fundamental physics, you know that's not likely you know, the last word on what's fundamental. Um, so physicists are happy to distinguish that that's maybe what they're aiming to do, but there's nevertheless there is value in what they're doing at present, even though they're probably not studying what's really fundamental. Um, uh, so I think it's just an interesting question as to why um, physicists are quite happy to say, we'd like to be studying the fundamental, that's kind of where we're going. But that's, there's still value in what we're doing, even though it's not fundamental, whereas it seems the language of metaphysics is... Um, uh, makes it sound as if it's only when you're studying what's fundamental that there's any sort of value in what you do. This is something that we're going to go back to. Point for present purposes is there's nothing obvious to me, at least, why it is that metaphysics should just be about the fundamental. And I think it's an interesting question to think about why. Okay, um, so we're going to be thinking about the metaphysics, fundamentality metaphysics. We're going to be taking a naturalistic approach, right? First of all, what do you mean by naturalized metaphysics? Well, we don't have any very precise characterization of this. Um, the idea is just that you are letting your metaphysical claims be in some sense non-trivially informed by scientific, by pertinent scientific theories. Um, now that in itself doesn't, there's not a whole lot of content to that statement. I mean, if, if what you're doing is practice of naturalistic metaphysics is just to sort of look at some physics theories and then, and then, and then, sort of think about them and be inspired by them and just and nevertheless go ahead and and argue for some metaphysical view or perhaps torture the interpretation of that physical theory such that you can use it to some to argue for some view that you're just a priori committed to anyway. That doesn't sound like very naturalized metaphysics. That sounds like a kind of corporate listening exercise where you sort of <laughs> make it look as if you're using science but you're actually just gonna gonna go ahead and argue for what you're doing anyway. And I think a lot actually um, some of what's called naturalized metaphysics probably has that character. Um, but in any sense, what you're kind of aspiring to is to sort of let physics kind of lead the way in some sense um, when you're doing metaphysics. So why should you do that? Well, lots of interesting methodological questions there. Um, but I would say, um, you know, to a metaphysician who, who, who treats metaphys who does metaphysics from the armchair, you know, after all, it's not science. Right? We're asking questions a lot of the time that scientists go and ask. It's not obvious that we should use their methods to answer them. What I would say is that if you can show that physics has really significant metaphysical implications, it's really hard to deny that metaphysicians have to pay attention to science. Okay, so if you're a metaphysician, you think that you can intuit from the armchair what you know the modal nature of the world is. Um, and yet it turns out, and you can do that in an a priori way, and it turns out that physics has really interesting implications for what the modal nature of the world is, um, then it's hard to um, imagine that any kind of um, correspondence between what the metaphysician has to say and what the physicist has to say about modality would actually you know, match up. Like it would just be happenstance that you know a conclusion that you reach through a deeply a posteriori process just happens to converge <coughs> with something that you can map, you, you can you can intuit a priori. So that for me would be the best um, justification for why metaphysicians have to pay attention to science. And so what our focus is going to be today is, is going to be on the antecedent here. Does physics have really significant metaphysical implications? Now of course all of you think it does. 
I'm going to be focusing on those metaphysical implications that I dedicated a lot of my research to. And these are going to be modality, structural realism, and the concept of fundamentality itself. Um, so the way that we're going to try and argue that physics is replete with implications for this stuff is by, first of all, reflecting on how physicists understand what's fundamental and the kind of conditions, the necessary conditions that we put on that. Um, Um, so the way that we're going to do that is by reflecting on what physics requires of fundamental quantum field theories, right, and the kind of the constraints that operate in that domain, right, and how they in turn constrain our metaphysics. Um, now, in so doing, right, given that we're going to be asking questions as all metaphysicians do about what's fundamental and what's not, there's clearly a problem here. Because we're going to have to acknowledge right at the very beginning that quantum field theory is uh, likely not a fundamental physical framework. Right? This isn't the framework in which the, um, the ultimate uh, nature of physical reality is going to be described. Right? So here I've made a distinction following um, Abner Shimoni um, between physical theories and physical frameworks. So by a physical theory I will understand something like a set of natural kinds together with a given law for their interaction. Right, so charged particles interacting under uh, an elect uh, spherical electromagnetic potential, uh, that would be like a theory. Um, quartz and gluons interacting with one another under the, the, the strong nuclear interaction, that would be another theory. A framework, on the other hand, is a set of high-level ontological and dynamical principles that are used to constrain and classify theories as theories of that type. Um, so uh, two charged spheres, uh, construed as classical particles interacting under a spherically symmetric potential is going to be a theory of classical physics insofar as those particles are assumed to have definite position and momentum at all times, insofar as the laws assume to be Galilean invariant and so on. Um, the quarks interacting with gluons um, in accordance uh, uh, under the strong nuclear interaction is going to be a theory within the framework of quantum field theory if um, the entities involved are quantum fields, right, and have all the kind of metaphysical accoutrements that are, uh, would go along with being quantum fields, having a holistic structure, or being a superposition principle, and so on. And moreover, insofar as the dynamics concerned, respects the basic principles of the framework of quantum field theory, right, the, 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 uh, the dynamics is Lorentz invariant, it respects the superposition principle, um, it respects the Born rule, and so on and so forth. So, um, we're going to be talking about fundamentals. So within the framework of quantum field theory, one can define more and less fundamental theories. Um, and you can even talk about the very most fundamental theories within quantum field theory, but those aren't the most fundamental theories simpliciter if the framework of quantum field theory is in itself a truly fundamental framework. Okay? Um, so our argument is going to be somewhat hypothetical. We can't do any better because we don't know what the true fundamental framework is right now. Um, but we know some things, we have some feelings about what it's going to, what it's going to look like. Um, so although what we're going to be doing is sort of fictionalized in some sense, we can ask ourselves at various points how much of our argument we expect to carry over into the next fundamental framework. And points where I think I see clear questions, you know, points where these questions clearly arise, I'll sort of, I'll just indicate with an asterisk to remind myself as we go. Okay. So that's what we're going to be doing, and we're going to focus first of all on what fundamental quantum field theories might have to say about our metaphysics of modality. Um, so, when you are debating what the modal nature of the world is, you, one tends to identify it as either a human or an anti-human. Yeah. yeah, I just want to, for, for our physicists, yeah. to say something about what modality means. Okay, sure. So, um, the, basic, uh, the basic idea is if one is just giving a description of the actual world, um, you describe so-called, you make what we often call categorical statements. Categorical is just a kind of another word for unconditional uh, statements. Statements about matters of fact, how things as a matter of fact are. Um, one also, so you know, one can say uh, mm -hmm. things like, you know, this cup is on the table. Um, one can also, of course, make claims about what would happen to this cup were I to do something or other. You can ask what would happen to this cup if I hit it and splashed splash it all over my computer. Right? One can ask these questions. And one can ask these questions and we think generate sensible answers to these questions, even if I don't, as a matter of fact, hit this cup and have it spill all over my computer, right? which is something that I'm not going to do. 
Um, so when one is asking questions not simply of, or making statements not simply as to how things are, but how things would be if one were to do this, that, or the other, one is engaging in what's called modal discourse, right? Um, discourse about what is possible, or discourse about what is necessary, what necessarily would happen if one were to do this, that, or the other. So the um, classic question that uh, Humeans and anti-Humeans focus on, the classic modal question, is um, how we, one ought to interpret so-called laws of nature. Right? Laws of nature are describe relationships between properties. Right? If a charge of this sort is presented with a charge of that sort, then something happens. Right? Um, say it starts accelerating towards it, or it's repelled from it with such and, you know, such, and such acceleration in meters per second squared. Um, if you were a human, right, so science, obviously the kind of goal of science is to provide us with these relationships between properties that we call laws of nature. If you are a human, um, if you're a human, you're going to say um, that those connections between properties that we write down in laws of nature, uh, they represent just descriptions of what actually happens. They're just a very convenient summary for what actually happens in this world. Um, and there's no sense to the idea um, that things, in some sense, had to happen in that way. There's no sense to the idea that charges had to be repelled from other charges when your uh, light charges had to be repelled from one another when presented, uh, brought into proximity <coughs> with one another. It just so happens that they, that they do that. Anti-humans, on the other hand, um, think that there's more to laws of nature than that. That they represent not just the way that things do happen, but the way that some things the way that things in some sense have to happen, right? That there's a necessity involved in these connections. Um, so part of the anti-human intuition is just that it would be an extraordinary coincidence if, um, you know, it seems every time that I take a pen and I let it go, it falls to the ground. Every single time I do it, every single time I have done that, it simply falls to the ground. And it's just because that's just how things happen. That's just the way it is. When a priori, there's an infinity of different ways that things could have gone. They only seem to go one way. And it's very hard not to have the intuition when presented with that remarkable phenomenon that they always do it that way because in some sense they have to do it. Right? Why, how else could we explain why they always happen the same way when there's infinitely many other ways that things could have happened, it seems. Um, so humans, on the other hand, don't think there's any sense in this language that things have to happen this way. They simply do. And so in some sense, it's just a brute, unexplained fact about the world that these regularities take place. Okay? Now, to put my own cards on the table with how I think about the debate between humans and anti-humans, I've kind of got a foot in both camps. Um, I'm with the anti-humans in that I see um, the Cumian's failure to give some kind of account of why regularity is this extremely surprising, extremely useful feature of the way things seem to happen. Um, I think their failure uh, to give some kind of account of why that happens as an abdication of philosophical responsibility. Right? I appreciate that probably everybody has to take some facts as group. We'll talk about that a bit tomorrow. Explanations need to be there. Explanatory buck has to stop somewhere, but that just strikes me as a really bad place to stop it, right? That is my intuition. Okay, metaphysics is full of people operating on intuitions and torturing scientific theories, right, to try and make those intuitions seem right. Okay, that's my intuition. On the other hand, I am very much with the Humeans in that I think that the explanation that anti Humeans give of this kind of necessity um, is crap, right? It's completely vacuous. And so what I would like to do, what I would like to be the case, is if we can look at something like fundamental physics and find that it can give an explanation for why there are these remarkable regularities in nature, um, but to provide us with an explanation of where they come from that is somewhat less vacuous. And that is exactly what I think we can use quantum field theory to do. Okay. Um, this, these yep. are divisions in the philosophy of science community or I mean, the what is in the philosophy of science community? This, 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 the anti-humanism seems really stupid to me. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm ignorant, right? No, no, so no, I it's can not that you're ignorant. No, 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 and, it's, not, it's not that you're and, ignorant. And how, many you're how many people believe that? Uh, so, <laughs> this, so this is a really, no, I think this is a really serious, I interesting question. Yeah. Physicists find the, uh, the uh, human point of view um, Unfathomable. Why would you possibly like? Why would you bother? Um, so think of it this way: if 
if you're an anti-human human who think that um, it's perfectly, there's a sense in which this thing, it always falls to the ground, but it could do, it could do otherwise. So let's theorize, we give a whole theory about how this thing could behave. Um, given that the, given that the anti-human is committed to the idea that this thing is perfectly <coughs> capable of operating in accordance, behaving in accordance with laws drastically different from those that the actual laws, the way that the actual laws operate, um, these questions of how this thing can behave are not questions that you can use physics to, to kind of guide you with. Right? Whereas if you're a physicist, like if you're going to talk about what this thing is capable of, you're going to use physics. And that means using the actual laws of nature. So in some sense, there's not any other way that this thing can behave other than the way it does behave. Now, that is um, one, that's a little bit sort of naive because what physicists are happy to do, they're happy to entertain the idea that fundamental part, say quant, fundamental quantum fields, um, to theorize about other laws that say um, uh, that any given fundamental uh, quantum field could could um, um, could accord with. I mean, people talk about things like enter entertain counterfactual possibilities, like what would happen if the electromagnetic force was a hundred times stronger than it actually is at the distance of a femtometer? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, then the world would look really different because. The kind of the, the nuclear strong force that's holding the protons together is going to start to be kind of eclipsed by the electromagnetic um, repulsion between them, and then you know it maybe wouldn't have any stable matter. Maybe the world would look really different, right? These are modal claims, counterfactual claims about how reality could be distinct from how it is, and yet we can ask these questions in a well-controlled way because we're asking them within a well-understood physical framework. Okay, um, so. So yeah, so for physicists, it seems nonsensical to, to try and think about the world, try and think about the things that we find in this world behaving in ways drastically different from the ways that they actually do. Because it's completely unconstrained, it seems, by scientific theorizing. Now what is strange, and strange to me, is that probably, I don't know, within the philosophy of physics community, humanism is seen, it's certainly very normal. Would you say it's more, it's like more popular? Uh, anti humanism versus anti humanism? Yeah. I think anti humanism is becoming more popular than it was. Uh huh. Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah it, the, it's funny. I, <coughs> the last time I gave a talk <coughs> with a physicist in the audience and I presented these two views, the physicist thought that humanism was insane and not anti humanism. So, <laughs> and, and, so, so and, and, and the reason is. You just didn't explain it right. No, <laughs> I mean, so like the thing about the thing about the difference in these two views is that on humanism, there's no sense in which the laws of physics govern what happens. They're just they're just lists of what happens. They they don't govern what happens. And and I think like working scientists also, you know, tend to approach things in such a way as that the laws do govern what happens. So I, you know, yeah. yeah. That's why I'm an anti-human, so I think laws govern what happens. Yeah, so Nick Huggett is a representative of the, the kind of contemporary human... Maybe, maybe it will make more yeah. sense to see why... I, I, I the one thing like... people might have read is the Feynman's book on the character of physical law, and I think that's a kind of, the kind of view he has of laws there is a kind mm. of human view of the patterns. So I think that might be something that physicists have Well, it seems absorbed. to me that to be anti-human, from what the little bit I've learned now, you have to have some sort of explanation in terms of something else. And if your physical law is the most fundamental thing you've come up with, it may be provisional yet, mm -hmm. and I think physicists are generally quite well willing yeah. to change and, and explain that physical law in something else, uh -huh. but it means you have to have something more provisional. And just to, to postulate that there must be something more fundamental more, more fu not, not more provisional, more fundamental, uh, uh, you know, that you can e explain it in terms of it. To, to insist on that ahead of time seems seems a little silly because, you know, how do you know? I mean, so you do the best you can, and then if you come up with an explanation that has a, has, has smaller primitives, then you use that. So, um, right, so, yes, yeah, so, um, so everybody's quite happy with the idea if you have a non-fundamental law, you can in some sense explain that non-fundamental law by a more fundamental law. But what humans are not going to be happy with is the idea that given the fundamental laws, um, that they do more than just describe the way that things happen to happen. Right? That they have some, you know, some people see it as a kind of creepy sort of springs in nature that sort of force things to happen um, over and above 
the, the, the kind of force events to happen, there's, that there are kind of springs in nature forcing events to happen in a certain way over and above just the attraction of events themselves. So it go back, goes back to David Hume. All you are ever, all physicists can, physics can ever, it seems naively, ever tell you about are what, what sorts of events happen in the world. These so-called necessary connections between them are not things that you can observe. Um, so what place is there in science for postulating these connections? Now, we don't buy into Hume's epistemology anymore. Um, but plenty of people, you know, most, most philosophers who object to Humeanism mostly do so um, because they, they think it postulates something that is intuitively attractive but for which we can give no empirical meaning. Okay, so one can show that a human, uh, under, well, as I, as I understand it, one can show that the, any evidence that you will have for that a law is a necessary, re, re, laws represent necessary connections in nature, things that always had to happen as opposed to simply do happen, is going to be evidence for the idea that laws are just regularities and vice versa, that there's nothing to empirically distinguish these two metaphysical interpretations, which is part of the reason that we call them metaphysical. To, to be yeah. fair, there yeah. is in physics something which is debate like that and it's very alive and very active. It's about so of course physicists, you know, we, we have the rules of nature, let's say it's just not on the But then where is the debate taking place today? Well what about the mass of the electron? Should I look for a theory that explains the mass of the electron? And people some people argue yes, which the fundamental theory should explain that, or some other says no, it's silly. Yeah. It's totally silly. It is it is what it is. And you should not look for an explanation. Yeah. So there's yeah. there's a distinction between things that you, you you should explain and things you should not explain. And this is a very strong debate. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it divides the theoretical physics community yeah. in some way into what uh, you know the proponents of uh, multiverse or whatever. You know, like trying people trying to string theories, people trying to find a, yeah. an explanation for the fundamental structure of constants. So Alan Cohn yeah. and his model that says it should come from mathematics. Which is yeah. very different from the particle physics attitude says it's just the UV problem. Yeah. Of them, and that's it. Absolutely. So, so there's going to be there's analogies which certainly end up there's going to be disanalogies because one is more clearly empirical than another one perhaps. Um, uh, but these strong analogies between these debates, people have different intuitions about where the explanatory part should stop, right? And this is the this is the intuition that divides these two camps. Um, so maybe it's to, so just just to, just to be clear, right? So metaphysicians, contemporary metaphysicians, so this is more to the philosophers, um, or understand this debate in a, or kind of frame this debate in somewhat different terms than philosophers of science do. Um, metaphysicians tend to frame this debate in terms of whether <coughs> modal language is part of your primitive ideology, like when you write down the final metaphysical theory of the world, where you have to postulate. Um, uh, terms such as it is possible that or it is necessary that or will you, will you be able to get away with not doing so and in order to give a satisfactory account of, of science. Um, in philosophy of science it tends to be over whether, whether laws represent necessary or rather just entirely contingent connections between properties. Okay, so the Humean dictum is there are no necessary connections between distinct existences. It's just this and that and that's all there is to say about it. Okay, so I say that I am I'm with the humans, I'm with the anti-humans, and that I think that we really are obliged to try and give some kind of account, at least try to give some kind of account of the remarkable fact of the regularity that, that nature um, exhibits. But I'm with the, the humans, and that I think that the explanation standardly given for this is crap. So let's see how it goes, and maybe you'll get a feeling for more of a feeling for why philosophers are very often attracted to humanism. Um, so anti-humans, right? They, to be clear, right, so we have this phenomenon, every time you let go of a pen, it falls down. A priori, it could have gone all sorts of other ways, but it happens to always fall down. Why is that? That seems quite surprising. Can we give an account of, of why this always happens? Anti-humans say it always happens that way because it has to happen that way. Okay, that sounds great. Can you put some more flesh on the bones? Well, the way that anti-humans tend to, this is the only anti-human position I'm going to present, um, probably the most popular one, um, the reason that what the connections between um, properties, uh, such as you know, being a pen at so far, whatever distance above the centre of the Earth, um, always falls towards the centre of the Earth, right? These are two properties connected in a certain way. Um, we say these are necessary connections. Where, from whence does this necessity arise? 
Well, they hold it's because the fundamental properties, right, such as the particles making up this pen and making up the earth, are essentially dispositional, right? That's going to be the answer. So what does that mean? Well, um, to say that a certain property is a dispositional property is to say something like the following. Um, for any object with that property, were you to go up to that object and stimulate it in a certain way, then it would do something, right? Then it would manifest a certain property, okay? Which is kind of symbolized up here. So this is a subjunctive conditional, which means that if you were to do this, you don't have to, you don't have to actualize that, but if you were to go up and stimulate it in some way, then it would do something, right? This is explicitly modal language, right? But what would happen if you were to, you don't have to actualize that, but if you did black, right? So it goes beyond what's merely actual. So for example, we say fragility is a disposition because for any object that's fragile, if you were to go up to it with a pair of bolt cutters and whack it, then it would break. That's what it means to call something fragile. Right? So that's our analysis that we get for dispositions. Um, now, uh, fragility, of course, isn't a fundamental property, um, but dispositional essentialists think that the same kind of analysis is going to apply to even the fundamental properties such as charge. So, to say that charge, to regard charge as a disposition is to say that, well, if you were to go up to a charged particle and expose it to another charged particle, then it would scurry off with acceleration whatever meters per second squared. Okay. Now, of course, humans aren't going to deny that if you were to go up and do that to a charge, then that's the sort of thing that would happen. Um, but they don't think that there's any, they think that's just how things go. They don't think there's any necessity attached to that. So, um, whoops. Uh, I don't know what's happened here. I'll just. I can see the gray under here, right? So, um, what dispositional essentialists are going to do is they're going to enrich this analysis of charge to say something like um, for all charged particles, it is necessary that. If you were to go up and stimulate them in a certain way, then they would, if you were uh, to go up to them and, and, and shine another charged particle on them, then they'll scurry off at however many meters per second squared. Because, um, so they're going to stick and explicitly stick a kind of necessity, a necessity claim in here. They're going to say, it is necessary that blah. And the reason that they do that is they say, that is the essence of what charge is. That is its nature. So it's Aristotelian language. Charge has a sort of nature. Its nature is to be dispositional. Okay, that's its nature. Okay, so one consequence of this is that in any world in which you have charged particles, because essences follow objects around across possible worlds, um, it's going to be the case in any world in which you get charged particles, you're going to get, uh, create such a situations in which if you expose one of these charged particles to another charged particle, it's going to scurry off. Okay, in other words, it's going to be a law in which Coulomb's law holds. Um, so, dispositional essentialists, they have a couple of explanations. They have an explanation of why the laws of nature in this world are what they are. Answer, the fundamental properties have certain, uh, have a dispositional nature that is such that, it, so if you think of Coulomb's law as a kind of concatenation of infinitely many claims about what would happen to a charge if you show a charge of however many Coulombs at whatever distance, um, you have an explanation of why the fundamental laws are the laws that they are, and you also have an explanation of why they're necessary, why this pen couldn't have done anything other than fall down. Answer is, well, in any, uh, you know, in any world in which this pen occurs, right, it's going to be made up of particles, those particles are going to be charged, and they have a sort of nature such that it's the essence of those particles to behave in the way that, to behave in the way that, that they do in this world. Um, so there's a quote here from Alexander Bird that will be important for me later on, but you can't see it. If the particles and fields are the same across two different worlds, then they'll instantiate the same essentially, essentially dispositional properties and hence give rise to identical laws, right? In any world in which you get electrons, they're going to obey Coulomb's law, say. In any world in which you get masses, they're going to obey Newton's law of gravitation or whatever. Okay. So they have an explanation of where laws come from and an explanation of why they're necessary. But it'll be clear to you that the explanation is crap. Because these properties, these essentially dispositional properties that we attribute to particles, have just been kind of reverse engineered from Coulomb's law, right, in such a way that they're going to imply Coulomb's law. But that implication is trivial, because you build all that information about Coulomb's law into the nature of these properties. And moreover, um, you're only able to argue that, that they're only able to argue that the laws represent necessary connections between properties, um, because you put all this necessary stuff 
you packed all that necessary stuff into the properties themselves by saying that properties themselves are essentially this way, i.e. things with those properties are necessarily going to behave this way in, in any possible world in which they occur. So you've just kind of outsourced the explanation of the necessity and the laws um, to modal facts, primitive modal facts about the properties themselves. It's not really an explanation that illuminates anything, to my mind at least. So, a lot of the time, what motivates Humeans to argue for what, from a scientific point of view, seems quite counterintuitive, um, for this Humean point of view, um, is the dissatisfaction with this, with this explanation. So everybody agrees that the explanatory bug has got to stop somewhere, um, but the explanation Humeans give, anti-Humeans give, is like really bad. So again, this parallels Hume's argument for the existence of God. People say, why does the universe exist? You know, priorities, what, it didn't have to exist, so why does it exist? And they say, oh, but there's this being that has to exist. And he, because he has to exist, and then he's able, um, namely God, God um, is the supreme mover and is able to kind of create the world there. That's your explanation for why it is that the universe exists. Um, again, it doesn't seem like a very good explanation because you have to then posit this other entity whose, ex whose existence seems just as much open to a need for explanation as the existence of the universe itself. So why not just stop with the universe, right? Why postulate God? Something has to be taken as brute. Why not have a more parsimonious ontology in which you don't have God, you just have the universe. That's the thing that you wanted to explain. So what Humeans tend to do um, is to have a very different approach to, um, have a different, a different approach to properties, uh, fundamental properties than, than um, dispos dispositional essentialists do. And in particular, they regard fundamental properties as what they call categorical. So what does that mean? Um, well, if you look in the literature, people will say they're not dispositional properties, or not essentially dispositional properties. Um, so this is another theme from the paper that you might read, be reading for this afternoon. Categories in metaphysics are often defined in pairs, like mutually exclusive and jointly complete pairs. Um, and this is sort of no exception. Um, so people have sort of noted that there's actually, it's, anti-humians often say that there's a kind of a problem, um, there's a problem with the way that humans understand properties as of categorical properties because you have to understand them in completely negative terms. You can't say what they are, you just say what they're not. Now it's not clear to me that that's really a problem. Um, so for those of you who are philosophers, you'll be sort of aware um, Lewis, say, has the notion of a gerrymandered property. So if I say, right, this, this, this cup is white, being white seems like a nice natural property. Um, being not white is not a natural property, right? In the sense that things that are, well, things that are white all have something substantive in common, namely the color white and everything that that implies, how they reflect wavelengths and so on and so forth. Um, things that are not white are as gerrymandered as you like. There's an infinity of different colors that these things could be, right? So they're not similar. But it's the job of properties to kind of bring things together under meaningful classifications, um, to track meaningful resemblances in nature. Um, so generally, if you think that some property or some predicate is sort of meaningful, then you don't think that the negation of that predicate is a very useful predicate, right? So that's often seen as a kind of objection to this view. But it's not clear to me that that's really an objection. Um, like we were saying, metaphysics is one way of thinking, for me a more helpful way of thinking about metaphysics, is it's a study of reality at its most general. Now maybe if you look in that class of things that are all sorts of different colours, when you look at it from a certain level of generality, there's plenty that we have in common. Right? So it's not clear to me that these kind of objections um, apply at this very abstract level. Um, nevertheless, um, when you look into the, how humans describe um, describe categorical properties, although it's not a problem to me that they tend to be defined in negative terms, it is a problem that they tend to be defined in very, just very sort of metaphorical terms. So people say that categorical properties are unlike dispositional properties and they're free of gnomic commitments or independent of their gnomic role. They're properties that don't look outward to interactions and so on and so forth. So it's often wrapped up in this very metaphorical language. And it, to me, it'd be nice if we could sort of sharpen it up, give an analysis of these properties, just like the dispositional essentialists give us, give us an analysis of them. So let's try to do that. So if you look into the literature to help, um, one way that humans, or people in this debate in general, um, try to give us a kind of a, a feeling a, a feeling for what categorical properties are, right? This is obviously a piece of arcane metaphysical terminology, right? It's not obvious what it means. Um, 
and the way that they help us get a feeling for what's going on is to um, is to give us a bunch of examples, right? And then the, of, of what it means for a property to be to be to be categorical, right? How that plays out in the real world. And the example that pretty much everybody seems to take is either Coulomb's law or Newton's law of gravitation, right? So let's focus on Coulomb's law. Um, so if categorical properties are properties that are free of gnomic commitments, then presumably it makes sense to say that charged particles may have acted in accordance with laws other than Coulomb's law. Right? As Alexander Birch says, negative charges may have been disposed to repel positive charges. Um, or some other relation than Coulomb's law may have held between them. If properties are categorical, that's a perfectly coherent possibility. Right? Or perhaps instead of acting in accordance with an inverse square law, they could operate in a, the charged particles could behave in accordance with an inverse cube law. Um, so just to formalize that a bit, if kind properties, right, say properties of charge, properties that charged particles have, um, if these are categorical, and if Coulomb's law is a law at the top, then it's metaphysically possible for particles like these um, to act in accordance with, so this means possible, act in accordance with a law that's just like Coulomb's law, but for a sign flip, right? So like charges are now attracting, unlike charges repelling. Or similarly, it's perfectly possible for charged particles like these to behave in accordance with a law that's just like Coulomb's law, except for um, it takes a, the dependence at the bottom takes the form of a cube law, not an inverse square law. So when you say possible, you mean mm -hmm. I can imagine that? Um, well, so everybody can imagine that. It's Well, the claim is everyone can imagine that, but only humans are going to say that what you can imagine also represents a coherent metaphysical possibility. Okay. So what the modal epistemology is and how imagine, conceivability relates to metaphysical possibilities of congestion. But that's what the two counts are. They might mean the here. same thing by those two claims. <coughs> the, so the human who's not uh, a modal realist. Mm -hmm. And then right. Cut through things a lot. It's not like they're saying two different things by saying they can imagine okay. it. There's a and there's a possible world. They might that might just be the same thing. Yeah. So they make that make, is that is maybe your is that your possibility? Yeah, that's like the sort of that's I think yeah, think probably the Rutgers school. Right. right. Yeah. Humean antique but not modal realists. But, so. Okay. Um but it seems strange from the physicist's point of view that when you do that and you imagine you do that because you're uh, Essentially, it's taking and then you're going to select the model that fits. But it's it's a it's a transient state. Right? Okay, so so, so it's like, yeah. So you, you might be ignorant about what the and actual. Then, and then after you know the establish, you all these models are ruled out, and then you, you sure. your model. Yeah, yeah, but but physicists. So it seems there you're um, physicists are imagining things to uh, partly to, because you don't know what's actual. But physicists also entertain possibilities that they know are not actual, but they're still yeah, referred yeah, like to like regard as possibilities. Point, you know, uh, you the model that works. Well, the model that works sounds like the a model that's charge. empirically adequate for this world. Yeah, but uh -huh. that defines the charge. Because the charge is defined by its interactions. Okay, so, so that's so exactly so well, that's yeah, at some point. Yeah, you know, that's exactly what a human is going to deny. If you give me another charge, there might be another rule for it. So, yeah, so this is why physicists tend to think things like charge is defined by its interactions. So Newton thought that like mass was defined by its interactions, right? That's what you mean by mass, something that acts in accordance with these laws. That's exactly the anti-human point of view. But that's not, humans are just going to completely deny that. Because these properties are, pardon? But we're talking about definitions, not essences now. A human could perfectly well say, well, look, I'm actually going to, as a matter of linguistic fact, define charge in this way. And okay. then, of course, considering this other world, I've now violated that linguistic definition, but that's not... But yeah, yeah, that so doesn't seem... that seems compatible to me with the, the Humean point of view. Mm -hmm. Right, so again, we're having very different conceptions of metaphysics here, whether we're just sort of defining... like the formalist yeah, yeah, idea yeah. where you just yeah. sort of define stuff and do what you like, or whether you're a realist about metaphysics where you think you're getting to the fundamental... Yeah, 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 no, I, yeah. I, totally, I guess that's the point I was trying to... because they're almost talking about defining, but I think that's kind of good different from the essences. So. Right. So certainly the human, if, if that's what he's going to say, it can't be that the essence of charge in some metaphysically heavy sense is... Yeah. So is, I think, I mean, I not to put words in your mouth, but insofar as you're saying what a physicist does is different from what a mathematician does. You're thinking of physicists as giving ideas about what things are as opposed to what words mean. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so that's a very natural stance with humans to say that these properties are defined by the physical theories in which they enter and the way that they behave. 
Um, but that's that's the anti-Humean intuition, and that's the, that's exactly what he means deny, which is why it's often so strange to a scientific group. Okay, so just to press on, right? So. Um, People, to try and help us get a handle on what categorical properties are, they give us these little examples. This is the sort of thing that I mean. If charge is categorical, not essentially dispositional, it should be possible for it to um, feature in laws that are different from the laws that it actually features in, like in these ways. So what I want to do, because it'd be nice to sort of precisify what we mean by categorical property, is to just kind of abstract away from what's going on here, right? Categorical properties. The notion of categorical properties is supposed to apply to all properties whatsoever, not just charge. Right? and not just Coulomb's law. All laws, humans have an interpretation of all laws, not just Coulomb's law. So let's abstract away from, from what's going on here, try to say something more general. So Coulomb's law is, a, is, a, is a, an example of a, a classical law, and it takes the form of a functional law, right? a law that looks something like this. Okay, so we have, maybe this is a distance between, so maybe this is the charge in a particle, maybe this is the charge on another particle, maybe this is the distance between them, um, so these charges are going to be represented by like real valued functions, maybe in other cases real vector valued functions, representing some determinable properties like charge um, or distance. But it's not only the case that we have uh, the properties to think about, we also have to think about the, the, the way that they are mathematically related, right? We have to think about the functional form of the law, right? And it's F here that is going to give us the kind of that, it's a functional, a function of functions, and it's that that gives us the shape of the law, right? As an inverse square law or an inverse cube law or whatever. So to be clear, um, when we're thinking about laws of nature in these debates, right, we need to have gone beyond the sort of all ravens are black, like if it's an F, it's a G, sort of representation of what laws of nature are that we get from positivism and so on, okay? The debate has moved beyond that. Maybe when Hempel was writing, that's the kind of idea that people had about laws. It's not the way that we think about them anymore. So here's what David Armstrong has to say about this, right? One a major player in this debate. The laws that have the best present claim to be fundamental are laws that link together certain classes of universals, right? Classes of properties. In particular, certain <coughs> determinate quantities falling under a common determinable, in some mathematical relation. Okay, so a determinable property is like charge in general, or mass in general. Determinate properties are charge of three coulombs, mass of four kilograms, etc. Um, so these are functional laws. Only if we can get some plausible account of functional laws do we have a theory of law here that can be taken really seriously. Okay, now, before when I've given this talk, I've kind of well, let me put it this way. I don't want to get my knickers in a twist too much about whether you can represent laws of quantum field theory in this functional law sorts of way. Right? It seems to me that quantum theoretic laws are expressed as Hilbert, you know, operators acting on a state in a Hilbert space, and you can't really shoehorn that into this form. Um, but on the other hand, you also have Lagrangians, and you have like action principles, and those look like equations of this form, and so on and so forth. Right? I don't want to get kind of too wrapped up in the idea of whether where we're going, namely quantum field theory is a framework in which we can express laws in this way. Um, what I take Armstrong to be saying here is that whatever the mathematics of the fundamental laws is, you need to take that into account when you're theorizing about how to interpret those laws metaphysically. Okay? Um, and presumably we'd only have to do that if the mathematics of laws right, can have real significant metaphysical implications. Now, I think it does, and he thinks it does. So those of you um, familiar with the metaphysics literature will have heard of, probably heard of structural universals. Um, so this is where, this is the juncture in metaphysics where this structural universals were introduced. So basically he used this facts about what laws look like mathematically um, to argue that if, you know, you think that there is some property or some universal corresponding to the property of mass, um, then you have to um, attribute a whole lot of structure to that universal because masses come, you know, it's never the case that something just instantiates mass, it always instantiates mass of some determinable, uh, determinate value, say mass 5 kilograms. So, but mass 5 kilograms, mass 6 kilograms, mass 7 kilograms and so on are all instances of mass and they all have something really significant in common. So how do we all wrap them all up together um, to make the determinable property of mass? And the way that he does it is by saying that mass is a universal that literally has parts. It has logical structure, and that structure is isomorphic to the real line. Okay? That's where he goes from this observation. Right? So he's using them here, he's using the mathematics of laws 
to make bold metaphysical claims, quite revolutionary metaphysical claims actually, to say that there is structure within universals. Okay? So the moral for present purposes is we need to think carefully about maths when we're going to, the mathematical structure of laws if you want to give a human account of them, or an anti-human account, a metaphysical account in general. Okay, so moving on, right, let's now use this to define what we might mean by categorical properties. So suppose schematically represented this is an actual law. Then if some property A, right, is categorical and hence free of gnomic commitments, right, independent of its gnomic role, as practitioners in this debate say, it presumably follows that that property, the instantiation of that property, places no constraints whatsoever of what can on what can happen over here. Okay? So in particular, it should be possible for um, charges to be functionally um, connected not only with charges, but say, I don't know, particles with weak isospin or particles with mass or something like that, right? That, that's, the, that's the property that charge talks to. It doesn't talk to other charges, it talks to things like these other properties. Um, so that should be metaphysically possible, but moreover, it should be possible for charge to feature in a law that has a different functional form than the laws that it actually enters into. Right? It could be an inverse cube law, it could take a sign flip, it could change in all sorts of other ways. If charge is literally free of gnomic commitments, then um, um, all uh, arbitrary, um, it, it should be possible for this to, uh, for it to feature in laws with an arbitrarily different functional form, it seems to me. Okay. Wait, right. so, huh? Sorry, from another scale, don't we know that to be false? From, from what? Don't we, know, from scale, don't, don't we know that the notion of anything conserved to resistant quantity yeah. is inexorably tied to a very specific form of a, of a physical law? Yeah, so that's what I would say, right? I think when you actually think about the role of symmetries in physics, and their function is almost like a priori constraints, and what you mean by a property or what you mean by a consistent object, then all of this stuff seems wrong. Um, that's what I'm going to work with. Yeah. That's another thing here, right? That, yeah, so what I'm going to be interested in is um, whether you can arrive at laws that have the properties attributed to them by the anti humians such as it's necessary, this could only behave this way, without putting in by hand primitive modality. Okay? I'm probably not going to get to the end of this, but we have today, but we have tomorrow as well. But we'll see, we'll see how it is, I'm going to set up this. Um, I'm going to try and realize that ambition. Okay, so that's what I'm going to say. It seems to me, again, if categorical properties are free of gnomic commitments, and part of what goes into gnomic commitments is facts about the mathematical shape of the laws in which these properties feature, they should be able to feature in laws of an arbitrary shape. Right? That's what it seems to me. Now, I have to admit, I'm hesitant about this because even Humeans seem to be hesitant about this. Here's the kind of um, archduke of, of contemporary humanism, David Lewis the late great David Lewis. I support the denial of essential nomological roles, right? The idea that he supports the idea that properties are categorical by means of the principle of recombination. Okay, so everybody, a lot of people won't know what the principle of recombination is. So if you're a Humean of the Lewisian stripe, you're going to regard reality as a giant mosaic of local matters of fact, right? This already sounds problematic from the point of view of quantum mechanics, but people have tried to kind of modify humanism so we can account for that, but let's just present Lewis's version. Reality is just a giant mosaic of, 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 of matters of, local matters of fact. So you have a charge here, you have a mass there, um, you have um, weak isospin there, you have blah, 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 whatever you have, um, whatever properties are fundamental in that world. According to the principle of recombination, you can just sort of take bits and pieces out of this manifold and you can swap them around with one another. You can take some property that's only manifest in some other world. Um, and you can slot this property in from that other world, you can slot it in here, and you can just like do this sort of human chop of change, chop and change, and in so doing, you can create new metaphysical possibilities. Right? That's the principle of recombination. So as he illuminates it, start with a world where the quark colors and flavors do feature in the laws that are supposed to be essential to them. Right? So feature in the laws um, that are <coughs> the laws that are that are actual, right? Because they that seems like a, a good, the actual world seems a good place to start. And dispositional essentialists are going to say that those laws, the laws that parts do accord with in this world, are essential to them. Now, by patching together duplicates of things from that world, i.e., patching together duplicates of quarks, right, and just kind of recombining them in arbitrary ways, we can presumably describe a world where those laws are broken, i.e., where other laws hold. Right? This is essential to the kind of human point of view that you can take quarks and you can do things, you can sort of 
shift them and, and sort of permute them amongst one another and, and, and with other fields and create a world in which radically different worlds hold, it seems to me. But here he says, presumably describe a world where these laws hold. It's like, you tell me, what am I supposed to think? It seems that you're committed to that. What's this word presumably doing in there? So even they seem a bit hesitant about this. Also, it's got to be said that the examples that people give of how you can change laws of nature, so to come up with coherent possibilities, are often just tweaks. We take a plus sign and we change it to a minus sign. We take an inverse square law and we change it to an inverse cube law. They're always extremely ginger and extremely sort of um, modest like changes. So how that squares with the fact that there's properties that are supposed to be completely free of normal commitments, I don't know. Yeah. So you think that presumably is hesitance about the principle of recombination. I wonder if it's hesitance about he doesn't know, really know what QCD is. <laughs> I think that, no, seriously, I think that might yeah. be what his, that, that might be what, in which case he's not hesitant, which is good for you, right? Mm. Right. Um, but, I mean, if you're hesitant about QCD, why use quarks, colors, and flavors as your example? But I'm just going to talk about this theory I don't yeah, yeah, understand. Yeah. And I'm going to use it to build the foundation of my entire metaphysical system. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound right. So what I'm but going to argue—that's what he kind of does, right? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so what I'm going to say, and again, this is going to be a physicist's point of view. Um, when actually you think about what things like the property of color is, then you can't get color to behave any which way. In fact, I would argue that if you think color is a fundamental property, um, then it can only behave one way, i.e., the way that it actually behaves, and it's just consistency constraints. In, the, in the, the limits that are appropriate to fundamental quantum field theories that are going to do that work for you. So if you're a physicist, you can probably already see where this is going, right? But I'm gonna fill in, um, I'm gonna fill in the other steps. Okay, so a summary of this, um, some of the metaphysical background here, right? If you're a human, um, you think there's no primitive modal ideology, right? So any statement of the fact that, um, uh, you know, what's possible or what's necessary can ultimately be analyzed in terms of what simply does happen, right? You can give an, get an analysis in, in modal free language. Properties are categorical, and that means that there's no constraints on the form of law in which properties, particles, i.e. things carried out with a given set of properties of a, kind, of a given kind can, um, can occur in. Um, if you're an anti-human, on, on the other hand, you're committed to primitive ideology, modal ideology, claims about what's necessary and possible are just like bedrock, right? They, in particular, they don't get an analysis in terms of what simply does happen. That's not a rich enough structure to, to get that for you. Properties are essentially dispositional, and there's only one law, hence only one mathematical form of law, in which particles of a given kind can occur in. Now, what I would argue is that fundamental quantum field theory suggests that this is not the whole modal landscape. There's room for another position, what I call Humean necessitarianism. It's a point of view in which laws are highly constrained, indeed perhaps uniquely constrained, um, hence in which we can say that the laws of a given set of kinds, or duplicates of those kinds, um, the laws they accord with are necessary to them. There's only one way that they could behave. But yet we can get there without putting in any primitive modal ideology by hand. We just let the mathematics do the work. Right? There's going to be a background assumption here, um, maybe you're not familiar with, uh, as, a, as a physicist, but if you're a human, mere logical or mathematical necessities are just fine. Right? These aren't things for which you have to give an explanation. It's natural necessities in particular that are not kosher. Okay, so let's see how far we can get with the city. We won't finish it up, but let's see how far we get. So, as we've seen, it's the fundamental laws that everybody's interested in these, in, in, in these debates. Armstrong was explicit about it. We've got to think about the fundamental laws. Indeed, metaphysics, for some people, is definitionally about the fundamental laws. That's what we're interested in. Now, these laws are not classical laws. If there's one thing we know, it's not that. Well, maybe we don't even, strictly speaking, know that, but it seems like that's a fairly good bet. Um, so, Coulomb's law, for example, is not going to be a very good representative of what our fundamental law looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, think about you know, what's a better framework for thinking about these laws. So let's pretend that quantum field theory is a fundamental framework, right? It's probably not, but let's pretend that it is. It's the best that we have. What does it have to say about the actual fundamental laws? Right? What laws are actually fundamental, right? So then we'll get our hands on those laws, and then we can argue about what is possible for the things featuring these laws to do. Okay, well, say as little as I can to set up what I need. So a generic law in quantum field theory is going to be defined by uh, Lagrangian. Uh, this is going to give us uh, uh, so a, a law 
featuring a certain set of canes, say park canes, kind of park. Um, it's going to tell us, uh, it's going to include a, a free part that's going to tell us about what they, they're kind of, how they undulate, but they're not under the influence of, of other particles, um, or in, under the influence of interactions, and a law that's going to govern their interactions with other stuff. So here's a Lagrangian for a fermion, a sample Lagrangian from quantum field theory, right, a generic, we're just thinking generically now. Um, here's a Lagrangian for a fermion field of mass M, undergoing self-interaction, right, that's a perfectly possible, in some sense, um, law of quantum field theory, we just have one fermion interacting with itself. Um, so we've got the free bit, we've got the interactions bit, interacting bit, and this coupling G is going to tell us about, give us information about the strength of the interaction of the field with itself. Or um, we could also have the Lagrangian for quantum chromodynamics, so this has um, a free part, the part that's going to tell us, so this is a theory of quarks and gluons, it's going to have a bit telling us how the quarks behave independently of their interactions and how the gluons behave. Um, and it's going to tell us a bit about how uh, the interactions between these two different kinds of field. Okay? So here we have the big D, the gauge covariant derivative. This dissolves into a couple of parts. Uh, so this is this irregular partial derivative that's just telling us about how the unperturbed uh, quark field, free quark fields are kind of undulating with respect to space. And then there's this other bit, the IgA mu part. Now, I'll come back to this. This thing here has all the properties of um, 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 a bosonic field, a, a spin one bosonic field. Um, this thing here is a coupling, right, that's going to, uh, same sort of thing as up here, that's telling us the strength of these interactions. We sub this in there, then we get a term in which we have the terms for the quark field um, sandwiched around um, the terms for, the, the, this term for a bosonic field with a coupling strength um, in there. Um, in other words, we have a term that has the form of an interaction between um, quarks and gluons. So it has a term that has quarks and gluons coupled at a point with a coupling strength and, uh, associated with it. That's just what an interaction looks like in quantum field theory. Okay? So we've got a, this just a, a generic Lagrangian in quantum field theory is going to have that kind of structure. So what else can we say generically about laws of um, quantum fields? Uh, laws in QFT. Well, the other thing is, quite obviously, laws in quantum field theory are laws of quantum fields, namely laws of relativistic quantum systems. So what does that mean? Well, it tells us that these systems are going to be things that are evolving in Minkowski space-time, right, because it's relativistic. Minkowski space-time is nice and continuous. It also means that, so that comes from the relativistic part, and from the quantum mechanical part, it means that the dynamics is unitary. Um, so what that means, so this is the part that makes it quantum mechanical. Uh, to say that dynamics is unitary means that it's uh, linear and it's norm-preserving. So the linearity is going to allow us uh, the states of these things to superpose, which is, of course, a characteristic feature of quantum mechanics. And the norm-preserving aspect is there so that we can use the Born rule to compute probabilities from the theory. Um, so just to give a kind of, uh, put a bit of flesh in the bones here, for those of you who are not completely familiar with this, so quantum field theory is what we use to describe interactions um, in uh, particle accelerators, and particle accelerators work by smashing uh, normally two protons together. So here we have a couple of protons being brought together. Um, each of them has energy E, equal and opposite directed momentum, and these are going to smash into one another, and stuff is going to come out. All sorts of possibilities are going to be, uh, quantum field theory is going to give us lots of possibilities for what could come out, and because quantum field theory is a probabilistic theory, um, it's not going to tell us which one we get, but it's going to tell us what the possibilities are with the probability <coughs> attached to each. So maybe one possibility is that you create just one stationary particle, like a resonant state, right? A particle that has mass equal to uh, 2e, right? By kind of mass energy conservation, maybe that's one possibility. On the other hand, you could maybe create a, a larger number of sort of medium mass particles as opposed to one giant particle, or you could create a larger number of very light particles, right? And you can see how, how this can go. And in each case, the probability of creating these is given by, um, so each of these has a, a, a prefactor here, some c. Um, the probability of getting any one of these by the Born rule is equal to uh, that factor squared. Right? So that, um, in order for us to speak of these being probabilities at all, it must be the case that the sum of these squares is equal to 1. Right? That's what it means to say the dynamics is norm preserving, um, that this thing is equal to 1 at all times. Okay, so that's. Um, generic laws in quantum field theory. What do we mean by fundamental laws in quantum field theory in particular? That's what everybody is interested in. 
Well, here's some things. It seems to me it's going to be a law of interaction. The fundamental law is a law of interaction. Right, that's just an obvious fact about this world, right, given that things do interact, that interaction's got to come from somewhere. You may actually think that it's a conceptual truth for a fundamental law, for a law that deserves to be called fundamental. If you don't have interactions, you don't have structure. And without structure, you can't identify anything as privileged. Right? So what, what would, <coughs> sense would it mean to call something fundamental in a world that has no structure? Right, that's just a thought. Um, given that, and I'm not going to interpret where this comes from, um, we take fundamental, we take um, looking at smaller, smaller scales to correspond to looking into more and more fundamental aspects of reality. It must be a law that is not supplanted as we probe ever smaller scales. So what that means is that it's, it's a law that is not supplanted as we run our accelerators faster and faster. Because the smaller the end, the scale, the spatial, spatial temporal slice that you want to look at, the larger the energy you, you need to look at it, sort of by complementarity. But certainly, if you want to look at more fundamental stuff, you have to build faster and faster accelerators. Right? You have to pump more energy into the system. Let's not overinterpret that. Um, that just seems to be the case. Now, Given that, so it's got to be the case that this law is, um, is furthermore, it's got to be the case, in fact, within the framework of quantum field theory, um, that it's got to be a, a fundamental law is a law that is valid to arbitrarily high energies, right? As Nick puts it in one of his papers, it's got to be continuum compatible. Um, why is that? Well, we know that if there's some energy range, some, some finite energy, at which the law stops working, stops working as a, as a description of nature and has to be supplanted, that just means it's not a fundamental law, right? The next one that comes along is now a candidate for being fundamental. So it can't be supplanted at some finite energy. And according to quantum field theory, because Minkowski space-time is nice and continuous, in principle, there's an infinitely large energy range, right, for, for this theory to have to correctly describe. So what does it mean by valid? Well, ideally it would be empirically correct, um, but at the very, very least, it has to remain mathematically consistent. A law that isn't even mathematically consistent isn't very good as a law, isn't very good as a, as a component of a fundamental theory. So what that means is that a fundamental theory in quantum field, a fundamental law in quantum field theory has to be consistent with the unitarity principle, right, the linearity of norm preservation, even in the limit that energies get arbitrarily high, right, even in the infinite energy limit. Right, that's part of what physicists are going to mean by a fundamental law in quantum field theory. One that's, that, that stays consistent even in a limit like that. Now, it should be obvious, right? This is an extremely demanding requirement, right? A priori, you would not expect any theory to satisfy it. So why this, right? So it's two approaches to this. So again, here's one way of thinking about it. A more kind of intuitive one. Um, so when you're doing quantum field theory, your empirical evidence comes from smashing particles together in an accelerator, being able to produce um, outcomes that look like this. Maybe one particle that's heavy, or three medium mass particles, or five light particles that would all be consistent with mass energy conservation. Now, clearly, each of these, um, each of these factors here, the CI, is, in, is, it, is itself a function of the energy. Right? Until you put enough energy, you were able to kind of turn up CERN to the point where it, where it can uh, reach the mass of the Higgs, the probability of producing that heavy particle was zero. Right? And once you reach an energy threshold such that it crosses the mass of that particle, then its probability switches on. So each of these probabilities is a function of the energy. But we also know that at all energies, the sum of these uh, numbers here has to, uh, has to sum up to one. Right? That's just unitarity. That's required for us to talk about probabilities at all. Now, as you pump more and more energy into your system, there are ever many more combinations of particles that may be produced. Okay, so just think about this. Um, as, you, as you start crossing particle mass thresholds, you're able to say, start producing um, particle-antiparticle pairs. There are other things that you can now chuck into these states, right, and create yet more combinations of particles, right, that are consistent with all your conservation laws and in particular um, consistent with mass energy conservation. And in the limits, it shouldn't be too hard to ensure that there are just infinitely many combinations of particles that you could, in theory, produce in one of these experiments. So, in the limit of uh, infinite energy, not only must each, um, each of these functions, the CI, be well-behaved individually, which is just not something that you would expect. If I say, I've got a function of a variable here, and I'm going to let that variable go off to infinity, a priori, you don't expect that, that function to be well-behaved. 
right? It's a measure zero set of functions that are converging in a limit like that. So each of them has to be well behaved individually. Um, but collectively, they have to be exquisitely in concert with one another. Um, they all have to be nice and well behaved individually. They must not exceed one. Um, that in itself is, a, is, a, is a, a strong constraint. But collectively, they have to be so exquisitely in concert that the sum of them always is equal to one, even though in the limit there's going to be infinitely many of them to take care of. Right? That is a lot of balls to keep in the air right? for any one function to do. So a priori, we just don't expect to be able to write down a theory that has this really demanding property. Um, another way to look at it is that in quantum field theory, interaction couplings right, are functions of the energy. Right? That, again, shouldn't be too surprising. How strongly two particles are interacting with one another is a function of what the total energy of the system is. Um, now, uh, so this is actually a very <coughs> important aspect of quantum field theory that energy that um, interactions get stronger and weaker as functions of the energy, and the way that these uh, this coupling strength changes as we as we change the energy is given by something called the beta function, right, which has this form here. Now, generically, the predictions of a quantum field theory are going to stay finite, right? Have a shot at being mathematic. So the theory as a whole has a, uh, a shot at being well defined only if the coupling stay finite and hence if that some energy the beta function just disappears right the coupling just stops changing now one thing that we know generically about quantum field theories is that the beta function is a function of the full field content of the theory right it's going to feel every single particle every single field that you put into your theory now just looking at this function i just a power i do not expect that function to be well behaved at arbitrary energy right i just do not right as any this thing gets infinitely high um, that thing has got to go to zero. But most functions just don't stop changing, right, at arbitrary. Like, again, that would be a measure zero set of functions that does this. So it seems that given that the behavior of the beta function is uh, a function of every single field that we find in the theory, um, only very special combinations of fields are going to be expected to produce theories that we can expect to respect unitarity in a limit. Okay, so we sort of know that a fundamental law of quantum field theory, a priori, sort of, um, is going to be a really hard thing to write down. What Lagrangians do have the property of respecting unitarity in that limit? Well, here, there are no results that are both general, completely general, and nice and specific in what it is that they say. Um, so, we do know in general that it's going to be a function, what Lagrangians have the function of property of respecting unitarity in the infinite energy limit, is going to be a function of the field field content of the theory. That we know. But we don't know what the constraints in that content is in all cases. We only know what they are in a very special set of cases, which is the set of cases, uh, set of theories whose couplings not only stay finite, but actually disappear to zero as the energy tends to infinity. Right? These are the so-called asymptotically free theories. Um, so clearly this is a very special set of theories. There's many, many more ways to stay finite than to be equal to stay equal to zero in particular. But it's the only ones, basically it's only these theories that you can do perturbation theory with, right? Because it's small when you investigate the high energy behavior of the theory. If, if the coupling disappears, you can use perturbation theory. Um, but they're the only ones that we are, partly because it's the only ones we know how to well, entirely because it's the only theories that we know how to handle mathematically. These are the, the only fundamental theories that we have any sort of nice specific constraints for. So, for now, we're going to take, for this reason, we're going to take the asymptotically free theories and the fundamental quantum field theories to be the same thing. Right, now this is an idealization because quantum theories of quantum gravity are not going to be asymptotically free. Smolin talked a little bit, I mean, one of the oh, his yeah. topics was asymptotically safe. Right. With quantum gravity. Awesome. So this is something you're... Oh, somewhat familiar with. Great. Okay, so in this special class of theories, what requirements do they have to satisfy? So the first requirement is this. In order to be asymptotically free, this, the theory has to be a long, non-abelian local gauge theory. Right? This was shown by Coleman and Gross in 1973 and approved by Casey. It's basically, they say, if your theory just has fermions in it, it's, going to, it's not going to be asymptotically free. If it just has fermions and scalar bosons, it's not going to be asymptotically free and so on and so forth. The only theories that are asymptotically free are theories that just have scalar bosons or scalar bosons and some fermions. Oh, sorry, uh, vector bosons or vector bosons and fermions. So, um, what does it mean to be a non-abelian local gauge theory? Well, very roughly, I'm not going to go into this, but um, it's a theory that is invariant under a set of, a group of local gauge transformations. 
So a local gauge transformation is one that kind of rotates the phase of the quantum state. So quantum states come with a little unobservable phase. If you rotate, a local gauge transformation rotates the phase of the quantum state at every point in space-time. Um, so at every point in space-time, we've got a little sort of structure defined where um, the, the, the phase can be rotated. It will be rotated by operators. These operators will form a group. Sometimes all those operators will commute, and sometimes they won't. And if they don't, you have uh, a non-abelian local gauge theory. Okay. Now, famously, so that's our first requirement on a fundamental theory. Now, famously, in this process, um, in the process of making a theory of free fermions gauge invariant, we have to change the partial derivative we looked at of the free theory into the gauge covariant derivative, in which something with the properties of a vector boson just pops out. Okay. So if we say, well, I postulate that there, as Lewis does, there are quarks at the fundamental level. I say, well, they better be interacting with one another, right? If if they deserve to be called fundamental at all. And I'd also just know that the fundamental law is a, a law of interaction. Um, the Coleman and Grossi's theory tells me that this, the theory in which they occur has to be a local gauge theory. So I start with my theory of the three parts, and I start making it a local gauge theory, and out pops a gauge boson okay, to mediate those interactions. Okay, so here's just a quote. It's important to note that in four-dimensional theories involving relativistic fermions like quarks, it's impossible to achieve asymptotic freedom without dynamical gauge fields. So what this tells us, first of all, is that the first of the Lagrangian we looked at, which is one in which they were just fermions self-interacting, that might be perfectly good as an effective theory, but it's not a fundamental theory. That's going to break down somewhere. Um, on the other hand, QCD, right, is a real candidate. It's not only one of the most fundamental, the most fundamental law we've ever written down. It actually could has quite could very well be a truly fundamental theory, at least insofar as quantum field theory is a, a fundamental framework, which it probably isn't. Now, the other crucial point for our purposes is that this, the, the fact that bosons kind of pop out here, is going to determine the form of the fermion boson interaction. That's going to be really important. The second requirement is that in order to be asymptotically free, um, there's only so many fermions that can feature in the theory. Right? Remember, the beta function is a function of the full field content of the theory. It turns out if you chuck too many fermions into your theory, the thing blows up. Okay, here's a quote from uh, Sidney Coleman. Theories of non-abelian engaged fields of Fermi multiplets, or Fermi fermions, are sometimes asymptotically free and sometimes not. If the theory has too many fermions, the sign of the beta function is reversed and asymptotic freedom is lost. It starts blowing up as opposed to disappearing. So for example, this is the beta function for QCD. It's a function of the number of flavors, or how many types of quark you have in your theory. It turns out, if that number tips over 16, the, the sign of the beta function reverses and asymptotic freedom is lost. Okay, so the asymptotic freedom of QCD is not an absolute property of the theory. Right? It's conditional on there not being too many fields around. So this constraint on um, this constraint on fundamental theories gives rise to what I call the Goldilocks principle, right? For fundamental kinds, it goes like this: whatever the actual inventory of fundamental kinds is, assuming they're quantum fields, it will take it will have a bunch of bosons in it, and it'll have a bunch of fermions in it. Um, for some number of bosons greater than zero, um, and with an upper bound on how many fermions you have, and these numbers are going to be related, right, in terms of the symmetry, the relevance, the non uh, the <coughs> Okay, so that's a kind of list of sort tour of what proper, some of the properties that fundamental quantum field theories, theories have to have. Um, so there was two requirements there. What I would argue is that the requirement of local gauge symmetry has implications for our theories of modality. And in particular, I think it opens up space for a position that we could call Humean necessitarianism. On the other hand, the second requirement, the Goldilocks principle, has implications for, first of all, structuralist metaphysics, and second of all, the very way that we think about fundamenta fundamentality at all. Okay, now I just realized I'm out of time, so would this be a good place to stop and pick up tomorrow? Um. Well, you told me, I mean, I think you maybe have five, a bit late. we did start a bit late, so if you want five minutes to wrap up, but if you want to stop now, we can drink um, more coffee or drink the same so I think of coffee it would more be, slowly. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be better to, um, 
this would, this would be a nice bit. I'm not going to be able to finish and have a chat about yeah. it. Do you minutes. want to take so, five minutes for questions or something? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And we'll continue. No one got the coffee. Yeah. No. So actually, Give us five minutes to get the coffee. We don't have coffee yet, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, thanks a lot. I was, I was thinking uh, at the beginning of the talk when we were uh, talking against the anti human so there are two kind of things they are trying to explain, and I agree one might not, might not work, but I think the criticism is about something else. So for example, if someone falls asleep here in the room, and we try to see what this person fell asleep, and then we discover that the person ingested opium in the morning, and we know like, oh, an opium, <laughs> opium has a disposition to make people fall asleep. That's a perfectly good explanation of what that person fell asleep. Like we know that opium makes these kind of things, mm -hmm. and we know that the person ingested that. So, yeah. so there is no like. Of course, if you define opium as such a property that makes you sleep, there might be some circularity, but that's okay because we're trying to explain the behavior in this case of the person. So I think the same could be said about the the, the properties in like they are trying to say why these objects behave as they behave, and then we say well. They do by virtue of the properties they have. Of course, you could ask, well, why those properties have the model profile they do? And then the explanation has to stop there. But you see that what I'm trying to say? So one thing is to say they put modality by hand. Mm -hmm. Another thing is to say, well, we learn from our work by experiments that some properties make objects do some things and not others. And then, like, no. Okay, as soon as you say make, you ventured into... Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I guess, so in science, in the opium case, like, we learned this person <coughs> ingested opium. By induction. Uh, oh, we ask him. Or, like, we, we, we explore the stomach. I don't know, somehow we learned that the person ingested mm -hmm. opium. <laughs> what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is that there is no... Pro there is a, that's a perfectly good explanation, and it's, it's still dispositional, right? And it stops there. So I guess that's what they're trying to do, like, in the case of love, like, why this electron did that? Because it has electric charge. And we learned that things with electric charge do those things. Why things with electric charge do those things? Yeah, the explanation stops at that. I guess... So yeah, I'm, I want to know what you think about that. Like, I think they're trying to distinguish two kinds of experiments. Yeah, so this... Yeah, so this um, explanation in general is just highly governed by pragmatic factors. Yeah. Um, and people here distinguish scientific explanation and from metaphysical explanation. And uh, humans will say that you can get what we call scientific explanations of why things happen, but not metaphysical explanations, something like this. Um, so the fact in particular that I, I'm interested in is the fact of regularities. Not any one, you know, and that's a kind of abstract metaphysical fact that needs to be kind of explained, not so much the specific scientific, um, specific you know, more specific empirical facts that maybe a scientific explanation is perfectly adequate. So something like that. Yeah, I guess anti humans would like that second thing. Like they would say, yeah. oh, we are giving a, a kind of scientific explanation in terms of this. Position. Yeah, and so again, and there's going to be different norms that govern explanation in hospitals that govern explanations in you know, the metaphysics yeah. area. Uh, Don. Um, first of all, Kerry, this yep. is a, a summer school, so I think oh, can we preferentially ask the students a question? You can ask whoever you like. I see Baptiste. Is that okay, Don? Are you a student? I, I don't know Tim Modlin's position sort of well enough. Really, um, I think, yeah, so my view is going to be, I'm going to have more of a story about where laws come from than he does. Um, 
I suppose that what Maudlin's doing is not providing an alternative theory of modality, but making a more kind of meta-metaphysical claim about what we should debate. Off the top of my head. Um, what questions we should stop asking. But I'm not so sure. I need to think about it. <coughs> Coffee hasn't appeared. Let's keep going. Thanks so much. Uh, so I was wondering uh, if uh, you could talk a little bit more about why a fundamental law must be interacting. Um, right. The, the thought that I had in my head was, uh, yeah. if I'm Aristotle, uh -huh. uh, fundamental law for the patent is that it has the downwards power. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't seem necessary to construe that. Right. OK, so this, I'm, um, partly I've got selfish reasons for doing that. Um, so. Insofar as we want to give a, um, an interpretation of the actual laws, then we're pretty sure that the actual laws are going to be um, uh, our laws of interaction, right? Otherwise, we have, you know, we, we seem to live in a world in which these skills are full of interactions and those interactions are going to come from somewhere and presumably they come from the fundamental laws. Right? That's just the job of the fundamentalists to sort of make everything else the case. Um, also, like I said, um, insofar as if you don't have any interactions, you just don't really have any structure. You don't have things like compositional structure. Um, so there, there probably are certain renderings, not all renderings of what you mean by something being fundamental, that meet the fundamental privilege with respect to something else. It's a kind of honorific. Um, but without any structure, there's, you know, there, there's nothing to be superior to, right? So you might say that's just not a context in which you can talk about being something something being fundamental. Um, it's, on the other hand, um, so me and Stephen, so this is, uh, to kind of look ahead, I probably won't talk about this in any detail, but um, Stephen French and I use these things, right, the, the idea that fundamental, fundamental theories have to be theories of interactions, and that by the argument just given, they have to be theories in which local gate holes on gate holes on to pop out, makes it very hard to regard any properties through which things interact, like charge or so on, as um, intrinsic properties, right? At least on rendering of intrinsic properties when it's said that it's something that could be independent of a component. Are you a physicist or a philosopher? Philosopher. Okay, yeah, so hopefully that's something that's kind of familiar to you. If something's an intrinsic property, it should be possessed by something, even if you're the only thing that exists, yeah. right? Um, so we sort of use this to argue, well, it, there's something about in these considerations that suggest that all properties, all fundamental properties are extrinsic. And that's what structuralists have always said, so hurrah for ontic structural realism. And then people came back and said, well, there's also, that doesn't follow, because maybe you could, you could take like these properties of, of parts, like being charged or having color or something like that, and forget about well done with their interactions. Like it's only if you assume these interactions that you're going to have gate holes on, that you have a requirement of local gate symmetry, right? Free theories tend to be nice and well behaved at all energies. It's interactions that cause the problem, because then you have the couplings that start diverging and kind of beta function and all that stuff. Um, so people said, oh, but if you um, think about worlds in which there's only the free fermions, right, then you, you can't run this argument. And presumably duplicates of these still have charge and color and all the other properties. So maybe, no, actually, they are intrinsic. By only focusing on worlds in which there are interactions, you're begging the question. The question being giving a description of the actual world. No, you're begging the question that all the, you're, by assuming that all properties are extrinsic and you only focus on worlds in which there's interactions, then you're just begging the question because if there's interactions, they have to be interactions between Stuff. So of course they come out looking extrinsic. If you focus on the worlds in which there's no interactions, then yes, you can still call them intrinsic. Right? That was the complaint. So two things I would say to that is that A, you're not begging the question of quantum field theory by saying if you have interactions, um, then all properties must be extrinsic because you can have worlds of non, uh, you can have non-fundamental theories of quantum uh, field theory, which you have like a single field self-interacting. So you only have one field and you still have interactions, right? So that argument doesn't seem to work. Um, but what's more, we need to take more seriously, what do you say about worlds in which you just have free fermions? If they still have their properties, and you can't infer the existence of gauge bosons, then it still seems perfectly plausible to regard those properties as intrinsic, right? Um, so what I would say to that, and this is just an issue um, that I think is really... Charge. 
Pardon me? You can't have because you put it in because you don't have a charge by definition. Well, so this is part the same of the no, 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 by definition, right? So well, in the sense that the charge is the company. If, if, oh, so charges, so, yeah. So or, or unless you, you provide another way to introduce. So that's what the humans are going to, are, are kind of going to do, right? But, um, we'll it's talk just, more about okay. this this particular thing sort of next it's time. Just more you can take that charge. Well, that's assuming, yeah, so, but, so you can still have, um, so let me, I'm not sure I can do it off, the, off the top of my head. Like, yeah, so you, you, can have, have other, you can have other properties. But if you have mass, then you can pose the value. So it's, it's but you have to say, so it, but it you, you have a U1 the theory, the kind of casper operator and the coupling current to be the same thing, right? It, well, I mean, what I'm saying is that yeah. there could be an object that has like that, but yeah. these objects are not the electrons, and we call them no mass or whatever. You know, they have no mass, they have no charge. So this is what. So, so this, they, they, there could be some other. I don't know. This is so. This is I think which are not. They are not the one we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. So this so is a thing that I think we we don't appreciate enough. So we tend to often when we do metaphysics of physics, we pay a lot of attention to idealized worlds in which there's like no interactions and people are giving up an ontology of quantum fields or something like that. Um, but I think these worlds do not contain duplicates of the fields in our worlds. It's, if you identify, because the properties that we assign, just repeat them actually, so the properties that we assign to fields are related to the coupling constants. So there's no such thing as the charge of the electromagnetic field. That's just not actually turns out a well defined notion. You have to specify what the energy is. And in a world in which there are no interactions, you're never going to create a situation in which that field has the value that you attribute to fields in this world. So these are just not, the fields in these worlds are not duplicates of the fields in this world. But it's by thinking about duplicates that we, that we, that we assess metaphysical possibilities. So these are just not metaphysical possibilities that are possibilities for the fields of this world. So, so, yeah. so, so, so the emperor of motivation is not so much uh, coming from uh, your observation of the transfer of the No, no. I mean, psychologically maybe, but not in the not in the in the, the last analysis. It just turns out um, that when you're talking about fields that are not interacting, they don't have the kind properties, the determinant values of the kind properties that the fields in this world have. Sure. So in your sense, are they different? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dan. Oh, sorry. So really, 15 minutes, and we'll be back down for 11:30 to carry on. Um, let me get you set up first, and then would you like some coffee or anything? Uh,